Thanks for listening to the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. You can contact the show at twitter.com forward slash dwgroovecast and through Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. Good evening. I am warning you right now, if you touch my drum, I will stab you in the neck with a knife. Ain't a fucking. Ain't a fucking. Mom! Take it easy. Lower it. I'm not going to lower it. I have to do this now. I don't want to play it, but lower it. Are we going to straighten out? No, we had a problem. I mean, uh, we tried to do everything we could. What do you mean? Well, you know what I mean. Next! Little trouble there. You're rushing. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Yeah! Hey there, Phil here from the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. We have another solo show for you today. John is taking a little bit of time away. He's getting rested and relaxed. So um, this is going to be another one of our series of educational podcasts. And uh, before we get started, though, let's go ahead and take care of the old perfunctories, right? Um, Thanks to everyone listening. We really, really do appreciate it. The show is just growing by leaps and bounds and and we monitor the progress weekly and just appreciate everyone to no end um uh, thanks for telling all your friends about us uh we trumpet this show as being an open forum to all of our listeners and we appreciate hearing from you as always you can email us our email address is drummers weekly groovecast at gmail.com You can also reach out to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Drummer's Weekly Groovecast and tweet to us at well at our Twitter account, which is at DW Groovecast. So again, thank you so much. Now that we're done with that, let me go ahead and warn everybody I'm about three cups of coffee deep into this, so uh, I might be going all over the place on this uh, podcast today. I'm amped up. Um... But today's topic that we're going to be talking about is called the teacher and student vocabulary. You're probably thinking to yourself, well, that's kind of a weird, weird title for a show. Don't really know what to expect. Well, it is a kind of a curious title, and it can mean a whole bunch of different things. And I'm even considering keeping that title as a bit of an umbrella for several different topics uh, that could fall underneath it. Uh, But today, what we're going to be studying or what we're going to be talking about is definitive methods that all teachers and students should be familiar with. And uh, really what we mean by that is that throughout the lineage of our drumming education, um, there have been certain definitive methods that have been written and learned and passed down from generation to generation that that all good, competent teachers and all well-learned students should be familiar with. And some of the importances of knowing these methods are simply, one, you want to make sure that you get your information directly from the source. And what I mean by that is, is You've heard me in different podcasts talk about something as, as simple as trying to learn the, the Jeff Porcaro Rosanna groove. And a lot of times what guys will do is just get online and they'll find some guy showing you how to play the Rosanna groove. Might be right. It may not be right. But the point is, is this information is maybe four, five, six times removed from the source which is Jeff Porcaro, when if you would have just done a little bit more research and typed in who played the original drum groove on Rosanna, you would most likely find out that it's Jeff Porcaro who played with Toto. It was on the album Toto 4. Then you would take the search term Jeff Porcaro, Rosanna groove, put it in YouTube, and sure enough, there would be the man himself teaching you how he originally came up with the groove and how it's supposed to go. So 
that's the first thing that I want to get to you. And then the second thing is this, is these methods that I'm going to talk about are referenced and cross-referenced regularly in different literatures and just in our general drumming education. And so you want to be familiar with these. If somebody asks you something about the Chapin book, there I gave the first one away or one of the first ones away, you want to, if you're going to be a well-learned guy, especially if you're going to be a teacher, you need to be familiar with these methods and know what these people are talking about and what it means, and, and especially if a student comes to you if you're a teacher, you want to make sure you're familiar with these methods. It's the industry standard, and we want to be well-versed in that type of thing. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and talk about how I'm going to approach this today. I'm going to talk roughly about, I guess, about 20 to 22 books today. And each of these books can be a lifetime study. So how in the world am I going to cram 20, 22 or so books into a podcast? Well, the answer is not very well. I mean, basically, I'm going to just scratch the surface on each of these. And it's going to be up to you to do a little drumming anthropology if you're not familiar with them. Um, so we're going to talk, we're just going to hit the very basic highlights of these books and then let you guys take it from there. So if you're not familiar, familiar with these books, get familiar with them. I realize that some of you teachers and veterans out there are going to use this just sort of as a checklist to kind of see, okay, I see where this guy's coming from. So let's start separating the wheat from the chaff. Let's find the signal out of all that noise, and we'll go ahead and get started with today's show. See you on the other side. Salacia, 17th century. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. How can I learn you? How can I read you? How can I thank you? And I can out philosophize you. Okay, guys. Onward and upward. In our little discussion today, I just want to let you know right up front that what I've done is I've separated these different methods into genres, but many of them cross genre lines. You know, they're just completely and totally indifferent to genres some of them are. So just be aware that when we talk about certain books and certain genres, you can absolutely apply them to others, any and all, actually. So the genres we're going to talk about are we're going to discuss technique, jazz, uh, Latin, brushes, and then we're going to have a little bit of a catch-all. We're going to call it rock, funk, fusion, and straight eighth methods. And then also at the end, what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, add another section. We're going to call it the wild card section. And, and that section is basically, it's just some miscellaneous methods that I feel like are in need of wider recognition. They're fantastic books. They don't a lot of times get mentioned in lists of like must-have, must-study books, and I'm going to mention four or five of those at the end of the show as well. So first and foremost, let's start out with the grunt work. And the grunt work is technique. And I'm going to be the first person to come right out and say that most of these books, there is nothing sexy about them at all. You know, I wish I could sit here and tell you that, boy, you're going to open up these books and you are going to just love working on the musical aspects of them but that's not necessarily what these books are about these books are it's about the nuts and bolts it's in there about tweaking the little things so the first book we're going to talk about is stick control by george lawrence stone dare i say students if you bring this up to your teacher and your teacher goes, wow, I've never heard of that book before. Sounds kind of cool. You should make like a Looney Tunes cartoon character and bolt through the door, leaving only a silhouette of your body. Seriously. you got to know this book if you're even vaguely familiar with drums in education. 
Some would call it the Bible of drumming. And just a brief, brief explanation of this book is it is just a collection of sticking and rhythmic exercises to help with technique. I'm really not going to say a whole lot more than that uh, because that's what it is. I mean, it's going to help you overall with hand technique, grip, finger technique, get you familiar with common patterns, rudimental patterns, accents, dynamics, and just overall consistency. Everything that you can put under the umbrella of technique, that's what it's going to be about. It can certainly be used also in conjunction with entire drum set exercises. In other words, you can adapt it to that. But, you know, this is primarily, again, we're not going to go that route with this book. We're going to talk about it from just a standpoint of pure hands, technique. Grab a couple of drum sticks, sit behind your snare drum or practice pad, and have at it. It's a lifetime study. Get out the metronome and start a working. That's about all I'm going to say about it. Like I said, we could spend an entire podcast talking about this book, but you need to need to be aware of it. You need to know it. All right, book number two. It's the sequel to Stick Control. I know what you veteran teachers are saying here. You're going, it's accents and rebounds. Well, that, my fine listeners, is a wonderful thought, and it is a great book, but I didn't put it on my list. What I'm calling the sequel to Stick Control is actually a book called Master Studies by Joe Morello. Now, most of you uh, folks, if you're familiar with Joe Morello, but are not familiar with this book, you probably know Joe from his time when he was the drummer for the Dave Brubeck group. And, of course, his infamous solo on Take 5, which is the bane of the jazz drummer's existence. But anyway, I digress. He is also known as one of the foremost drum educators as well. Um, Morello studied with George Lawrence Stone, the author of our first book, Stick Control. And Master Studies is the advancement and the contemporization of the Stick Control book. Again, I don't want to sell you that this is this wonderfully sexy uh, book. I mean, it's again, it's technique, guys. It's grunt work. It's lifting 50 pounds to get to the point to where you can become a, a weightlifter that can lift 250 pounds, so to speak. You got to start somewhere, work your way up, right? Um, it's got every dynamic, rhythmic combination you can think of. Every stroke combination, five stroke, seven stroke, buzzes, everything you can think of in this book is in there. So again, this is technique for technique's sake in the purest form of technique. So there we go again. Grab some sticks, grab a snare drum, prepare to work. It's Master Studies by Joe Morello. All right, book number three. Um, Book number three and book number four are by the same author, Charles Wilcoxon. And uh, book number three is called 150 Rudimental Solos for the All-American Drummer. Again, a technique book, but we're going we're gonna to throw a little bit of extra added musicality in this one because this is individual little snare drum solos. And aside from all the things that we talked about in the first two books, as far as like being a pure technique book that helps you work on technique, there are a few other very kind of unique and cool things that go along with this book. First off, it will absolutely help with your musicality because you're playing solos. You have to play solos and make some music out of them, make a complete statement out of each of these little solos. So it certainly helps there. It also helps your reading. Um, it also is a book that is just chock full of rudiments. And, and let me explain a couple things about this book, okay? This book, aside from, of course, having standard notation in it, every single solo is written out with complete stickings underneath every single note. And you have to play those solos using those exact stickings. Because when Wilcoxon writes these solos out, these stickings form very specific rudimental passages that he wants you to learn and play. So 
you have to make sure you follow the stickings on this to get the real meat out of this method. And just a couple of other things. Um, he has a few unique notations in this book as well. And I'll just spend just a brief minute on this. Again, any good, competent teacher should know this book. And if they don't know this, this little bit of eccentricity in his notation, run screaming for the door. And so let me go ahead and tell you that when he writes some of his roles in this book, in particular, we'll, we'll, we will use the seven-stroke role as this example. He writes the seven-stroke role out to be interpreted in two different ways. You will see a seven-stroke role written out as simply an eighth note, and we'll use the example of going from uh, the and of two over to count one in another bar in a two-four measure. Well, that seven-stroke roll is meant to be interpreted as a triplet or ternary style seven-stroke roll. All right. When he also writes seven-stroke rolls in duple or binary fashion as well. And when he does that, he does something pretty wacky. He will write out a seven-stroke roll in that duple or binary fashion where it will be what looks like a drag or a double set of grace notes tied over to an eighth note. So, for example, he might have that drag tied to the, we'll call it the and of two in a two-four measure that goes over or is tied over or rolled over as a seven-stroke roll to count one in another bar. Well, that drag is actually not a drag, or it's not a set of grace notes. It's actually the beginning set of doubles of the seven-stroke roll, which in this case would be started on the E of two. All right? So hopefully I explained that well enough for you. Again, any good, competent teacher uh, will know this, but it's just a weird thing if you pick up this book and if you're not familiar with it and you see it, you just want to make sure that you interpret those things, those roles correctly. All right, so there's my little two cents on that. Okay, moving on, we go to book number four, again, by Charles Wilcoxon, Modern Rudimental Swing Solos. All right, now you're probably asking yourself, well, what is the difference between this and the other uh, rudimental solos from the previous book? Well, there's a lot of similarities, but the, the biggest things are this. The solos in book number four, the modern rudimental swing solos are longer solos. And they also include drum set instruments as well. You have parts of the drum set that are included, such as the bass drum, tom-toms. You have some accessories like cowbells, wood blocks, cymbals, hats, that kind of thing. So it's a little more uh, inclusive of drum set um, drum set instruments in this book. Also, a couple of other things about this book that share uh, similarities with the first book is every single solo, again, is written out with complete stickings. So you have to make sure, again, you follow those stickings to be able to play the solos the way Wilcoxon intended for you to play them. Uh, and also another couple things, there are some what we'll call traditional and definitive standard solos that most any good, well-versed drummer should know. Solos like Rolling in Rhythm, that's the first uh, solo in the book. And then close to the end of the book, you have the traditional rudimental solo, Three Camps. And it's actually phrased in three different solos. There's like three camps, the traditional way of playing it, which is just in double stroke rolls. Uh, there's three camps in paradiddles, and then three camps written out in Rademacues as well. So there is Modern Rudimental Swing Solos by Charles Wilcoxon. Get it, learn it, love it. All right, so we're finished up with the technique section. Now we're going to go ahead and move on to the jazz section of our program. And the first book that we're going to talk about is called Advanced Techniques for the Modern Drummer by Jim Chapin. Uh, some of you will know Jim Chapin from a whole host of videos that you've probably found on YouTube. Um, he was a fellow that studied with the great Sanford Moeller. Those of you who are aware of the technique called the Moeller Technique, he is one of the foremost proponents and teachers of that technique. And there's a myriad 
of videos online uh, that you can learn from that Jim himself is a part of. So now on to his book, Advanced Techniques for the Modern Drummer. Jim wrote this book about 70 years ago. This thing was written in the 1940s, and when it was first published, it was, to my knowledge, the first of its, of its kind. Uh, a lot of drummers, when they first got the book, said that it was unplayable, that it was impossible, because this book was, again, one of the first ones of its kind that, that dealt with basic jazz independence, basic four-way jazz independence. And with that in mind, let me go ahead and say this. In the first half of this book, when you open it up, you will notice that there's only hand patterns written out. There's only like right hand on ride cymbal, left hand on snare drum. Well, you're probably asking yourself, well, that crazy guy on the podcast said it's basic four-way jazz independence. Well, let me say this. It's understood that aside from those hand patterns that are written in the book, that you should be playing your hi-hat on counts two and four and feathering the bass drum on all four quarter notes. Okay, so just keep that in mind when, when you're playing that first half of the book. When you get to the second half of the book, the bass drum is written out. And, but still, again, play your, your hi-hat on two and four when you're playing those, those, uh, those exercises in the back part of the book. Now, a couple of other things that I want to bring to your attention that I've heard misplayed and misinterpreted time and time again. The first two sections of this book need to be played literally as written, okay? The first section in this book is a section on dotted eighth sixteenths. Please play those notes as written. In other words, make sure you're counting sixteenth notes. Do not interpret them as swing patterns or triplet based patterns. Interpret them as dotted eighth sixteenths. That same sort of advice goes for part two when it's written in straight eighth notes. You must interpret those as straight eighth notes and play your ride symbol pattern as written dotted eighth sixteenths. That is indeed what Chapin intended for you to play them as. I've seen it time and time again where drummers will, uh, and even some teachers will, tell their students to interpret it as swing eighth notes. That is incorrect. That is incorrect. Make sure you interpret those pages as written, okay? All right, and then, oh, lastly, one thing about it. You'll notice as you go through this book, when you get to, end, to the end of each section, you'll see these little solos that are written out. Just as a little bonus point for you guys, each of those solos are actually based on melodies of songs. And if you want to do a little bit of drumming anthropology, you can... Do some Googling, and you can find out the names of those songs that each of those solos are based on. And then you can do a little more research, do some searches, and find those songs, and listen to the melodies, and see how they are actually relating to the solos that Chapin has written out. Okay, I think that's it for that book. Let's go on to book number two in the jazz section. It is Syncopation by Ted Reed, Syncopation Volume 1. Let me go ahead and say that. Now, this is the quintessential drum method book that was never intended to be used in the way that we primarily use it today, okay? And it crosses all styles. Every, every style of music that we can play on drum set or on drums can be adapted to be used with this book, okay? So, before we talk about the book proper, I'm actually going to mention another book that will be extremely useful to you with this book if you don't have a teacher that is familiar with this. There was a book written by John Ramsey. He's a teacher up at Berkeley in Boston uh, that is a book about... The syncopation book. This is well, this is a little hard to describe. It's basically inter the interpretation of the syncopation book by Alan Dawson, and Alan Dawson was again an early teacher up at Berkeley. John studied with Alan Dawson, and Alan is credited with the modern interpretation of the syncopation book. And what that means is that Dawson took, in particular, the middle 
parts of the syncopation book. The old printing were pages 37 through 44. The new printing of syncopation uh, from about 15 years ago up until this day are pages 38 through 45. He took those exercises out of the center of the book and he was able to use a whole bunch of different shell rhythms uh, whether it be jazz patterns, we'll call it like a, a, a jazz ride cymbal pattern, hi-hat on two and four, and then a bass drum pattern, and then you would read the syncopation lines on snare drum or bass drum or the instrument of your choice. I am grossly oversimplifying this, okay? But again, this is another one of these books, sort of like Stick Control. We could spend an entire podcast talking about it. So... That companion book that we talked about by John Ramsey, the Alan Dawson book, um, or the interpretation of syncopation according to the teachings of Alan Dawson, it's some really long convoluted title like that, is an absolutely fantastic companion piece to the syncopation book. Okay, And the syncopation book can be used again, oh my gosh, for every style you can possibly think of. It's fantastic for reading. I mean, it's it's one of the foremost texts that taught me how to read and how to read accurately. So, again, a gross oversimplification of the syncopation book. It can be used in so many different ways for so many different styles and for so many different aspects of your reading and technique, dynamics. Oh, it just goes on and on and on. A must-have. Uh, go ahead and get that book. Add it to your library. All right, we go on to book number three. Book number three in the jazz section is The Art of Bop Drumming by John Riley. This is one of just two or three books that we're going to talk about on this podcast that has been written in like the last 20 years or so. Almost all the other books are 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years old. So this is a relative baby compared to the other books. The Riley book, Art of Bop Drumming, is a good amalgamation of a whole bunch of earlier jazz method books and he basically contemporizes them, um, adds his own spin to them, adds a few other sections uh, to the book. It rounds it out, makes it a just a wonderful text for all around bebop drumming. Uh, there are some advanced independence exercises in there. He has a section on brush patterns, really nice section on brush patterns. It's got a nice little section on soloing, whether it be fours or eights or form solos. Um, he has a section of, of or he, all throughout the book, he's got nice transcriptions, which are, as anyone knows, is a wonderful way uh, to learn how to play certain styles. You take from the masters and make it your own. And then also at the end of the book, he has got a section of play-alongs that are just really, really well done, along with charts for the play-alongs as well, by the way. So that's The Art of Bop Drumming by John Riley. And not to be outdone, another John Riley book, Beyond Bop Drumming is book number four. Um, it is, again, the, we'll call it the contemporization it is the next logical step after his first book, That Art of Bop Drumming. It basically takes jazz, we'll call it mainstream contemporary jazz drumming from the early 60s up till today and gives you good practical advice, technique, vocabulary for the styles from the 60s on. Um, it has sections on advanced uh, four-way coordination and independence. Wonderful section on really integrating uh, your hi-hat, aside from just using it on count two and four, making it an active timekeeping voice, an active comping voice um, throughout all of your groove playing, all throughout your, your timekeeping. There's a wonderful section on up-tempo playing. Um, that up-tempo section is wonderful from the standpoint of giving you uh, good practical comping, uh, good comp, good practical comping ideas between the bass drum and your snare drum and hi-hat. Uh, there's a great section 
on odd time and metric modulations with some really good practical transcriptions in there uh, that, that really back up his, his teaching on how to play those different uh, metric modulations. Again, there's some sections on soloing. And then at the end of the book, again, uh, a wonderful collection of play-alongs as well. So that is Beyond Bop Drumming by John Riley, and that will close out our section on jazz. So we're going to move to our next heading. We're going to call it the Latin heading, and there's just a couple of books that I'm going to mention about that. Uh, the first book is called Brazilian Rhythms for Drum Set by Bob Wiener and Dudica da Fonseca. And really, there's just a few things I want to say about these books. And they're, they're very important, in my opinion. And the first thing I want to say about the Brazilian Rhythms book is that there's a bit of a history at the beginning that everyone should read. It discusses how we arrived at these common Brazilian rhythms and how we actually take these authentic Brazilian rhythms and how we adapt them to the modern drum set. That's very important to know. Very, very important to know. So make sure you take a few moments before you just start diving into the exercises in this book and read how these rhythms were conceived and then how they were adapted to our modern drum kit because most of them were never intended to be played on drum set. All right? The other thing I wanted to mention is that this book does a wonderful job of teaching many different variations of the same style. And what I mean by that is, is when he shows you a bossa nova, he doesn't just give you the bossa nova that we're all familiar with. He does give you that. But he gives you many different variations of it. And he will also give you transcriptions of great versions of bossa novas from great drummers. And what is so important about that, and I'm going to go ahead and, and say this in addition to, in other words, this is going to apply to the second book I talked to as well, when we start talking about another form of Latin, is that it is so important that you have many different variations of the same style Latin rhythms. Because I can't tell you how ridiculous it is, and, and, and to, it's just maddening in some ways, that I will have students that will come to me that have studied, and I will ask them to play certain styles for me, and I'll say, hey, play me a samba. And they'll play a samba, and they will almost state, this is the samba, and they will play the samba, boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, and I'll say, that's great, let's play another samba. And they go, well, that is the samba. And I say, well, that is a samba, that's not the samba. The student will go, well, no, that's, that's the samba. That's, that's what my teacher said the samba was. And then what I will say to the student is, how ridiculous would you sound if you went to Brazil and played that and said, this is the samba? I said, that would be as insane as having a Brazilian student come up here and you ask them to play a rock beat and they play boom, pop, boom, pop, boom, pop. And you go, hey, that sounds great. Play me another rock beat. And the student goes, that is the rock beat. And you go, well, no, no, that's, that's a common rock beat. Play me another rock beat. Well, that's what my teacher in Sao Paulo said was the rock beat. So you see what I'm driving at here, guys? That these Brazilian and Afro-Cuban and different styles of Latin rhythms, what we learn in North America is just the shell of the rhythm. There are many different bossa novas. There are many different sambas. There are many different bayons. So you need to learn all these different bossa novas. And more importantly then, this is another whole separate topic. You need to be able to improvise on them because these rhythms are also chiefly improvised as well. So, again, it's really not good enough to go into a gig and play Bossa Nova B14 all the way through the song and never vary it. It's improvised as well. So, again, this, this book does a very good job at teaching you that. 
Okay, so that's Brazilian rhythms for drum set. Book number two in the Latin heading is called Afro-Cuban Rhythms for Drum Set. And you can take almost everything I said about that Brazilian Rhythms for Drum Set and just apply it to this, okay? So, for example, in Afro-Cuban Rhythms for Drum Set, there are mambos, and there are sangos, and there are Afro-Cuban 6 eighths and 12 eighths and whatnot throughout that book. And the author, again, does a very good job about explaining to you where these rhythms originate from, what the original instruments were, or what the original instruments are, and how they were originally played, and how those rhythms and how those different styles were adapted to our modern drum set. And then as you go through the book and look at the different exercises, they do, again, a very good job of giving you different versions of them. And again, learn the different versions. Learn also how to improvise on these different rhythms and styles. All right. So that will draw a conclusion to our Latin section. Let's move on to the next section, which is brushes. Okay. I've got a couple of books in the brushes department that we want to talk about. And the first one would be, we'll call it the Bible of Brushes. It's The Sound of Brushes by Ed Thigpen. Um, most of you folks will know Ed Thigpen from a playing standpoint as being the longtime drummer for the Oscar Peterson Trio. Ed played a lot of brushes in a piano trio behind Oscar Peterson, so hence there is his street cred for writing this book. A couple things about this book. Ed does a wonderful job of addressing a whole lot of different styles where you can play brushes. So it's not just your basic ballads. Um, he does things for all different tempos, up-tempo swing, medium swing, a bunch of different variations for each of those. He also addresses Latin in there as well, different, different brushes for different tempos of different Latin grooves. So he does a good job. Um, giving you a lot of information. And also there's a lot of information in there about basic brush technique as well, which is invaluable for you, especially if you've never studied brushes. The other thing is that book is also one of one of the first books, again, that use, uses and does a very good job of explaining basic brush patterns with diagrams. Now, you know that with brushes, we have a lot of different sounds that we can make with sweeps or swishes on the snare drum, pops, thups, taps, ticks, rips, etc., etc., etc. Thigpen does a very good job at notating these. And they're, again, they're very, very difficult to describe, but when you see them written on the page, they will make a lot more sense. Um, these diagrams are basically uh, solid lines, dotted lines, dots for taps, arrows for direction. He does a good job of showing you which is the right hand, which is the left hand, uh, clockwise motions versus counterclockwise motions, and so on. Again, you just you need to get the book, and it will be a lot it, it will be a lot easier to understand once you have those. But he, his book is very well thought out, very well written out. There's also a corresponding uh, CD that will come with it, or if you're old school, cassette, uh, that demonstrates the sounds of these different patterns. And I would imagine you could probably go online and find even video descriptions of them now as well. The second book that I want to talk about for brushes is a long out-of-print book. But I'm going to go ahead and say that if you do a little homework online, you can probably find, if not a, a full PDF copy, at least various single images from the book Brush Artistry by the great Philly Joe Jones. Philly Joe Jones, probably most popularly known as the drummer in Miles Davis's first great quintet, was known as a masterful brush player. He uh, wrote a book published by the Premier Drum Company. I believe that book was published in the 60s, maybe the early 70s. I can't, can't remember. It's a long, long out of do, like I mentioned. A long, long out of print, I should say, like I mentioned earlier. And it's basically a collection of his personal brush patterns, which, again, 
Everybody needs those because Philly is well known as being one of the, the most masterful brush players in the history of drumming. And uh, he does a good job of playing, a lot, giving you a lot of options for uh, a lot of different styles, multiple ballad patterns, multiple mid-tempo patterns, multiple up-tempo patterns, patterns for Latin. So again, get the Philly Joe Jones book, Brush Artistry. Again, you're not going to be able to go to the store or even on Amazon or online anywhere and buy it. You're going to have to do some digging. You might have a friend uh, that has the book that can make you some copies of it. But it's absolutely well worth your time finding it and learning out of it. All right, moving on. We're going to go to the catch-all topic or the catch-all section. We're going to call it Rock, Funk, Fusion, and Straight Eighth Notebooks. Okay, and book number one we're going to talk about is The New Breed by Gary Chester. And for our long-term podcast listeners, you will know that in episode one, the very first episode, we had a section at the end of the podcast, and it was a section on great, underappreciated, and unrecognized drummers. And Gary Chester was my pick. Gary Chester was the East Coast version of Hal Blaine. Hal Blaine, the very famous West Coast drummer of the Wrecking Crew, played on a whole ton of recordings out there on the West Coast. Gary was our East Coast version of that. His discography is about a mile and a half long. So, aside from being known as a wonderful player, he also was known as a wonderful drum educator. And his method book, The New Breed, is now one of the foremost books uh, on straight eighth note playing and linear drumming. It was used by folks like uh, Joel Rosenblatt, Dave Weckl, Kenny Aronoff, and on and on and on. They were students of, of, uh, of Gary. And one thing about this book is that it has... It has got a very, very meaningful, conceptual approach that you have to be aware of. If you're not aware of this, don't even bother looking at the book. Um, It's many times misinterpreted incorrectly. I just want to spend a minute talking about the conceptual aspect of it. When you get this book, you need to read the first part of the book. And it's, it's rather lengthy, but if you don't, read it and use the concepts at the beginning, you're going to be playing the book not as he intended when he wrote it. So the first thing I want to say about it, he uses an approach called territorial rights. And you'll see that there's a diagram uh, on the book that basically splits the drum kit in half. And the best way I can describe it is if you're sitting behind the drum set and you're looking forward like you're looking at the audience, you would take just a line and put it between the two rack toms. We're going to assume you have two rack toms mounted on your bass drum. And it's going to split that bass drum right down the middle and in between those two rack toms. So for the right-handed drummer where your hi-hat is on the left and your ride cymbal is on the right, what's basically going to happen is when you're playing his time patterns, anything that uses... Uh, the hi-hat on the left or a ride cymbal that's mounted on the left, you will be playing that time with your left hand. Anything that uses time patterns where you're playing it with your right hand, it will be playing on the right side of your drum set where there should be a closed set of hi-hats and a ride cymbal as well. So you can kind of gather from what I'm saying, this is a very unique kind of a strange concept if you're not familiar with, familiar with it because it uses multiple hi-hats and multiple ride cymbals, okay? As a matter of fact, what you would have on the left side of your drum set, you would have a traditional hi-hat that opens and closes and also another closed hi-hat on the left side. You'd have a ride cymbal on the left side, ride cymbal on the right side, and a closed hat on the right side. Again, a little bit of a gross oversimplification, but that's the first thing you need to be aware of. And then the other thing you need to be aware of is you should be singing when you play this. Okay, I've already scared everybody with that, hadn't I? You're thinking you're going to have to sing some kind of an operatic aura 
or aria or some kind of lyrics along with it. Well, that's that's not what he means. The singing that we're talking about here is basically to accomplish a couple of things. It's going to accomplish you having five-way independence. And what we mean by five-way independence is you have both feet working, both hands working, and then the voice working simultaneously as the fifth mode or fifth way of independence. And the other thing that it does is it ingrains a quarter note value into your playing and into your singing and into your mind because the first mode of singing that you use is a quarter note style of of chant or singing like a da or a la you don't want to use numbers you want to make your voice mimic a quarter note pulse at beginning there's 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 many other different advanced ways of singing but that's the first way that he recommends and as you sing you want to make sure that you sing them with these systems that he has written out and you want to make sure that you sing them uh, all with the same articulation all right so that's probably more than you ever want to know about that but it's important that you know those aspects of the concepts of this book before you just jump in and start playing now about the book itself um he owes a lot to the read syncopation methods of interpretation because what he basically does is he gives you what we'll call systems where the hands and or the feet are playing these static patterns like one bar patterns and then he gives you uh, these pages of reading that are uh, different quarter note, eighth note, 16th note rhythms they advance as you go through the different reading pages to play within his systems right so for example the first system in the book it's pretty simple where both hands right hand and left hand are playing unison 16th notes on two sets of closed hi-hats so your right hand would be playing the closed hi-hats on the right side of your drum kit your left hand will be playing closed hats on the left side of your drum sets, playing them simultaneously. Not alternating hands, but playing them simultaneously. And as he says, you want to avoid flamming. Then you would read the line that he has written for the reading on the bass drum. All right, so enough about that. I've spent a lot of time on the, the New Breed book by Chester, but it's a very, very important book. And again, Probably a lifetime study for most of you. There's a volume two of it as well, if you like, if, if you didn't get enough of that. All right, moving on. Uh, book number two is actually a series of books. Uh, and it's a four-volume set of books by the great Berkeley educator Gary Chafee called Patterns. Now, he no longer teaches at the school, but that's where he where his claim to fame was and where he he's one of the guys up there with Alan Dawson that, that really got that program started off on a, a very strong foot. Uh, but the Chafee Patterns book, books, I should say, they they cover a lot of ground, a lot of ground for contemporary drum set education. Uh, his books cover odd time signatures, polyrhythms, metric modulations, um, note groupings between all the different drums and the bass drum. It's one of the definitive texts for linear drumming. And to kind of back up my point on that, some of his very famous students were Vinnie Colaiuta, Steve Smith, Ken Wood Denard, John Robinson. Just telling you that those guys worked with him out of those texts is probably enough to get you to run out and buy all four of them, I would hope. Again, a lifetime study. And uh, again, a gross oversimplification of those books. But Patterns, Four Volumes by Gary Chafee. You should run out and grab them. Uh, the next book we'll talk about is Future Sounds by David Garibaldi. Most of you know David from his long-term tenure with the Oakland-based funk band Tower of Power. Um, this book, Future Sounds, is pretty much Garibaldi's method for playing that Bay Area funk style. Um, it delves highly into linear drumming, linear groove playing, linear soloing, and so, so on. Um, he does a wonderful job of giving you basic time patterns 
and then showing you how to play these linear grooves, whether they be linear time patterns in conjunction with basic time patterns, or even linear solo type patterns in conjunction uh, with basic time patterns. And then he does, he does a whole series of what he calls permutations, which creates what we call, or what has been called, beat displacement or rhythmic displacement. So just a quick example is he will give you a basic time pattern that you will play for a few bars, and then he will give you a, 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 a rhythmic permutation that will take a groove and then maybe move every single note in that groove one sixteenth note later, or maybe one sixteenth note earlier in the measure, and create a rhythmic displacement. Again, for those of you who are not familiar with that term, that might be a little bit hard to conceive just by hearing me describe it. It's much more graphically um, uh, accessible when you have it in front of you. In other words, you know, when you can see it in front of you, you can you can get a lot more information or at least ex better explanation of it. But that's one of the things that he does a wonderful job with. Um, he works a whole bunch of different styles in that book from a standpoint of like um, eighth note based rock and pop to 16th note based linear funk, 12-8 styles, and so on and so on. One of the foremost texts in linear drumming and funk playing. It's David Garibaldi, Future Sounds. All right, so we move on to book number four. Book number four is a little bit of an older book written back in the 70s by Charles Dowd. It's called Funky Primer. Now, the main reason that I'm mentioning this book is the first two pages of drum set grooves, and I believe those pages are pages 13 and 14 in the book, could be the most important straight eighth note grooves and exercises that you will ever learn. They are beats that are written out on those pages that you will use from the day you pick up sticks to the day the sticks are put in your coffin. Uh, uh, groove number one is four quarter notes on the bass drum, two and four on the snare drum, and eighth notes on the hatter cymbal. Groove number two is bass drum on one and three, snare drum two and four, eighth notes on the hatter cymbal. And the next two pages of exercises are just permutations of that. Uh, I mean, that in itself, it's probably worth getting the book for, you know. As you go through the book, there's a logical progression of where he starts adding 16th notes to the snare drum and the bass drum, and then eventually it gets to the point where you get in the back of the book where he is doing grooves based on 16th note triplets. And one of the best ways I can describe that, it's kind of um, a la the kind of 16th note triplets that John Bonham used um, a lot that you're familiar with. So that's Funky Primer by Charles Dowd, a great book for beginners, a great book for seasoned professionals. Just take those first two pages, work those things at every every level of metronome marking you possibly can every different dynamic level and you'll be a better drummer for it all right moving on to book number five advanced funk studies by rick latham uh this book again is a book that's written i believe in the 70s it's just a bunch of no nonsense common funk patterns um, there's a little section in there on drum fills. It's kind of neat to have. You don't really have that in a lot of different books, but it's, it's, it's a good little section in there that you can learn a couple of, of cool sounding drum fills. But for my money, the part that I like of this book the best is at the back, he has a rather lengthy section of drum transcriptions. And what it is, is it's transcriptions of iconic funk grooves like for example 50 ways to leave your lover by um, uh, Paul Simon with Steve Gadd playing drums is in there definitely a good one to have along I mean and there's just there's a whole ton of other ones in there there's transcriptions in there by Erskine Harvey Mason Ed Green 
lots of good transcriptions. That the book it, the book is worth buying if nothing else for for those transcriptions in the back. Okay. Uh, and then book number six that will round out the rock, funk, and straight eighth note section. It's double bass drumming by Joe Franco. Uh, to me, this is the definitive method on double bass playing. And it uses a wonderful concept also, which I'll talk about just briefly. Um, it's the concept, Joe Franco uses a concept in here. And we'll, we'll use it applying it to like 16th notes between the two bass drums. Where his right foot, regardless of the rhythm that he's playing, will always play the ones and ands of the 16th notes. And the left foot will always play the E's and uhs. And so, for example, if he's playing a rhythm on double bass where there's a 16th note on the first count, a 16th note on the E, a rest on the and, and then a 16th note on the uh, he doesn't alternate his feet. Instead, what he would do is he would play the right foot on the one, the left foot on the E, and then the left foot again on the uh. Hopefully that makes sense, okay? So, yeah, when he plays 16th notes, the ones and the ands are always on the right bass drum. The E's and the uhs are always on the left bass drum, regardless of how those rhythms are composed and strung together, okay? Hopefully that makes sense to you. If you get the book, it will certainly make sense, but make sure you read it and make sure you use the stickings that he uh, has written in the book. There's a lot of great time patterns in there. Almost every conceivable time pattern you can think of between the feet are in there. So it's an excellent text for, for independence with that. And then there's a great section on uh, playing in, in, in triple meter or with, or with triplets. And there's a great section on there for just common fill patterns uh, that incorporate double bass as well. So pick up Double Bass Drumming by Joe Franco, an excellent book. Everybody should have it in their library. Even if you don't play double bass, you're probably going to have some students that are going to come to you and going to want to learn how to play. All right, so that pretty much wraps up what I consider your must-haves and the ones that everybody should absolutely know or that are at least very common books that everybody should know. I'm going to tag on to the end of this five more books that are probably less well-known but I feel like are incredibly valuable and need wider recognition. And so the first book that I'm going to talk about is Drum Wisdom by the great Bob Moses. Boston-based drummer. Um, you, if you know him from a playing standpoint, you might know him from um, he was in a group with the wonderful Jack DeJanet back in the early '70s called Compost. And if you are playing drums in a group with Jack DeJanet, that's pretty much all you need to know. So there you go, as far as his playing career. Uh, Drum Wisdom is a very, very, very different book. It is not a book based on exercises and patterns. There are some exercises and there are some patterns in there, but this is an expand your mind conceptual approach to playing drum set. There's nothing I'm going to be able to say in the couple of minutes I'm going to spend on it that's going to do it justice. I'm just going to hit some of the highlights, but let me tell you, Aside from all these books that we talked about that you have to have, this is the next one on the list. And, and let me say, I hope you can still buy this book. Um, it's 50-50, quite honestly. I, I haven't looked at it as far as like being able to purchase it in quite a while. Um, it at one time was uh, published by Modern Drummer Publications. Um, I don't know if it's out of print or not. Um, probably shoot an email or a phone call over to Modern Drummer and see if they can still sell it to you, okay? So anyway, getting to a little bit about the book. This book is a lot of reading, and I don't mean notational reading. It's just, it's literature style reading, and have an open mind when you approach it, okay? Um, he talks a lot about concepts on movement behind the drum kit, and the energy and the flow of energy when you're playing the drum kit. 
Um, it talks about musical time playing and musical soloing. Um, he uses a term that I love and that I use all the time. He uses a term called organic drumming. And there's a few different ways you can interpret that. But one of the ways that I like using organic drumming or I like referencing organic drumming is there are times when you can play certain styles of music that you play things that are not necessarily, uh, we'll call it notatable in proper notation. It could still be in time. In other words, you could be playing rhythms that are not notatable but could still be kept in time and we'll call it organic playing, you know? So that's one way you can interpret it. But but again, you know, if you read the book and you read his interpretations of it, you might come up with a different interpretation of it as well. It's totally fine. And then he has a great section in there on resolution points. Resolution points are uh, points inside of a measure that you can use as beginning and or ending phrases even middle phrases if i suppose you could do that as well again it's very much up to the reader's interpretation um a quick explanation of one way that you could use a resolution point for example you could have a four bar phrase and then you could have a resolution point inside of we'll say the second bar on the and of three. And what you could do is you could use that resolution point as a begin or an end of certain phrases inside of that four bar phrase. Again, that's just one way you could interpret it. So drum wisdom, in my opinion, it's a must have. I've had that book for 30 years. I still get it out from time to time, read it and, and learn something new. So Drum Wisdom by Bob Moses. The next book, book number two in our books needing wider recognition, is Inner Drumming by George Marsh. This book was introduced to me by my mentor, Keith Brown, when I was in undergraduate school. And I get misty-eyed almost thinking about it. It's a very important time of my life, and, and this book is a, a wonderful book that... I am sure that it's out of print. It was never really in wide print to begin with. I believe I had to order my copy directly from George. George Marsh is a San Francisco-based uh, drummer and educator. And uh, aside from Drum Wisdom, this will probably be the most different book of any of the ones that I've talked about today. And um, this book... We're going to call it a holistic approach to drumming. It is completely and totally indifferent to any and all music styles. Again, it takes an open mind to get this book, look at it, read it, interpret it. Uh, George, he wrote this book with a concept of allowing the natural flow and the natural motion between our limbs to dictate how we play patterns, natural or normal patterns. Again, that's a little hard to conceive, and it's impossible, well, I won't say impossible, but it's difficult to notate in traditional music notation and have George be able to get his point across to the drummer in the way that he likes. So what George did in this book was he created his own type of graphic notation that looks a little bit like brush patterns, but it's a series of thick lines, thin lines, arrows, dots, and whatnot that describe and illustrate his motion of how he wants you to um, interpret and play what he calls these inner rudiments, okay? Okay. Now, if that's not cryptic enough for you and will encourage you to try to seek out that book, I don't know what will. But it's a wonderful book. Again, approach it with, with an open mind and learn, learn, learn 
from the great holistic drum master George Marsh. Just a wonderful book, Inner Drumming. Go seek it out. Uh, book number three in books needing wider recognition is Drum Set Reading by Ron Fink. Ron either is or was uh, a teacher down at University of North Texas, down there with uh, Ed Sof. He wrote this book years and years ago. <clears throat> and it is a wonderful text on chart reading and interpretation for the drummer. It really is a wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, he does a great job of giving you a lot of different examples of a lot of different types of drum charts that you might have to read in a variety of different playing situations, whether they be live or in the studio. He gives you like proper big band charts with proper notation. He gives you lead sheets, rhythm charts, and gives you his ideas on how to interpret them. Really wonderful book. Uh, he has a whole section also in there about doing drum set fills that lead into kicks or lead into ensemble figures that you would want to learn how to play, like before you have to play big band gigs and have to set up different kicks and hits, ensemble kicks and hits. And he does also a really good job of explaining how to kick different parts of an ensemble and how to match sonorities on your drum set with the different sections that you might have to play with in a big band or in any kind of a band. And like, for example, what I mean by that is if you're playing a section with, a say, a 17-piece 17-piece piece big band and you're playing, we'll say, a staccato set of rhythms with low brass, it might make perfect sense to play those staccato rhythms with low brass playing staccato rhythms on your bass drum or staccato rhythms on a low tom-tom, if that makes sense. Or, for example, if you have to play more legato kind of rhythms uh, with the high brass, say like with trumpets, it might make sense to play those kicks as combination snare hits with cymbals to, to give you some you know legato length on those kicks. So that's that section in the book. Um, again... A lot of different kinds of charts in the book as well that will help you interpret whether you're playing in big bands, rock bands, studio ensembles, and whatnot. That's Drum Set Reading by Ron Fink. I believe that book is, is still readily available. You should, should be able to find it online. Um, another book, book number four. It's one of the more modern books also, probably written within the last 20 years. It's by Fred Dinkins. It's called It's About Time. And this book has got a lot of cool, unique things that I haven't necessarily seen in other books. It is, again, true to its title. It's about playing time, about playing good, confident time with clicks, without clicks. Also playing a whole bunch of different time patterns as well, whether they're 16th note bass time patterns, 8th note bass time patterns triplet based time patterns, quarter note based time patterns, and so on, whether they're played on the cymbals, whether they're played on hi-hats. He makes it a point to tell the drummer to use as many different types of sonorities as you can because when you move between, say, like ride or hi-hat, it can absolutely affect the way you interpret and play time. And to me, the brilliance in this book, aside from that, is he has a lot of really cool, unique play-along tracks. Where, for example, you will play a certain pattern in the book along to, we'll say, a four-bar sequence of clicks. Or a four-bar sequence of click track where the first three measures will be quarter note clicks. And in the fourth measure, it'll drop out. And you have to continue the time pattern without rushing or dragging so that you make sure when the click starts again to start another four-bar pattern that you're in time. And like I said, there's a whole series of those style play-alongs in the book. Um, and it's absolutely worth getting. That's It's About Time by Fred Dinkins. Oh, and you know what? There's one of the one of the very cool thing about this book. In the play-along section, there is a chart in the back that you can play along with. But there's also about, I guess it's six to eight different famous uh, drummers 
that do their interpretation of that chart. And you can hear how they played along with it as well. So it's very cool just to kind of hear the different interpretations that are in that book. Okay, so that's It's About Time by Fred Dinkins. And then the last book that I'm going to talk about today, and then we'll wrap up the show, is another technique book, a la the, the first few books that we talked about in the podcast. It's by Eldon Buster Bailey, longtime percussionist with New York Philharmonic. Wrist Twisters is the title. And again, this is a pure technique book. So I'm not going to try to sell this to you that it's going to be this super sexy book on technique. It's just, it's a little bit different from the ones that we talked about earlier from the standpoint that Buster Bailey has a very specific style of technique that he learned and that he perfected. And the first part of the book talks about that technique and how you should approach his book using that technique. It goes starts with grip and goes all the way to how he makes the strokes, catches rebounds, etc., 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 how he approaches accents versus non-accents. Uh, the book is just a series of, of stickings, series of little rhythmic patterns, working on accents and dynamics all the way throughout the book. A lot of really cool, challenging exercises in there. And again, you have to have a mind for minutia. The devil's in the details in this book. So grab Wrist Twisters by Buster Bailey. I think that book is still readily available. Might be a little harder to find than some of the others, but definitely worth seeking out. All right, guys. That's my take on books, on methods, must-have definitive methods. Hope you enjoyed it. Um... If you have any suggestions on books that I might have missed, or if there's some books that you, um, or that I talked about that you would like a little further explanation on, or maybe didn't quite understand some of the things and just want some more information about it, don't hesitate to contact us. We love hearing from you. Again, our email address is drummersweeklygroovecast at gmail.com. You can also reach out to us through our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash drummersweeklygroovecast. And you can tweet us at Twitter at DW Groovecast. We love bringing this show to you. New episodes every Monday. All right, guys. Looking forward to hearing from you. Talk to you next week. Bye-bye.